With more than 6,000 small and microcap companies listed, if you're looking for the next Apple at the earliest stage, then Channel Check truly is the orchard. The listed companies support Channel Check, so it's free for you, the potential investor, to gain access to institutional quality research from FINRA licensed analysts, advanced market data, industry reports, news, and a growing catalog of videos and webcasts. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and register for Channel Check so you're always up to date on what's going on at the small and microcap data place. Welcome to this special edition of the C-Suite series presented by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Noble is an SEC-registered FINRA licensed broker-dealer and the source of the equity research available on Channel Check. This Uranium Power Players Investor Forum presentation features Peninsula Energy, OTC ticker symbol PENMF, ASX ticker symbol PEN, following a brief overview presentation from Managing Director and CEO Wayne Hiley, Noble Senior Research Analyst Michael Heim will moderate a Q&A session. With that, I am pleased to present Wayne Hiley. Hello and welcome to Noble Capital's Uranium Power Players Summit. I'm Wayne Hiley and I'm presenting on, the, on behalf of Peninsula Energy. I'm the Managing Director and CEO. Peninsula Energy is an Australian listed stock. Uh, on the ASX, it's PEN. And it's also listed and, and traded on the OTCQB under the symbol PEN MF. Real pleased that you are joining us today, and I hope you uh, appreciate the presentation and the quality investment opportunity that Peninsula Energy offers in the uranium space. Uh, before we get going, I'll share with you the disclaimer and competent person statement and the cautionary and inferred resources notice. Uh, both of these will be available for your for their viewing on our company website. Uh, Peninsula Energy is a uh, US-based um, uranium mining company, even though we're Australian exchange traded. Our flagship project is the Lance Project in Wyoming. Uh, and we have very specific US producer opportunities that are very exciting at this time. We're led by a highly experienced and technically sound board and management team. We probably have the largest uh, on-site staff of any of the in-situ players in the United States with almost 30 employers actively uh, working at the site, getting the project ready for future production. Um, we are continued, uh, continuing to see the U.S. government supporting and revitalizing the domestic ener nuclear energy industry and uranium and nuclear fuel space. And we're very excited about those opportunities. I'll share some of that with you. Uh, but we will spend a little bit of time or an important amount of time on Lance. Lance is one of the largest U.S. uranium projects with almost 54 million pounds of compliant resource base. And importantly, we're the only U.S.-based uranium project authorized to use the industry-leading low-cost, low-pH in-situ recovery process. The Lance low-pH low field demonstration is occurring right now, and that's been the focal point for many investors. I'll share with you an update on that. Uh, we are excited because we have an extremely low capital requirement to transition Lance to low-pH and to... Uh, Put the project into production as a very short pathway six million dollars about six months from a final investment decision and the lance project will be up and running again producing uranium uh, peninsula uniquely generates a significant cash flow from our long-term sales uranium contract book uh, we're probably the only junior with a long-term sales contract book that's got fixed or base price escalated contracts rather than market-based contracts um, and we have about 310,000 pounds of uranium inventory in our in our possession, and that's valued at over $10 million. So you'll see that we're fiscally strong. Uh, we have a project that's ready to go back into production. We're watching the markets closely, and we're preparing for that day. Uh, the Lance Slow pH field demonstration, as I mentioned, uh, is probably the focal point for many investors today. Uh, this field demonstration will provide us with valuable data and insight on how the low pH process works at specifically at the Lance site. We started this project a year ago in August of 2020, 
uh, and we're using three large scale pattern areas uh, to, to gain this data. We're focusing on operational pH, op, uh, oxidation reduction potential, the key chemical parameters for successful in situ recovery in a low pH environment. And then we're looking at pattern configurations, how we design our patterns and lay them out, how we uh, then also take the uranium solutions that we recover from the well field and we recover the uranium in the process plant. Historically, there's been um, challenges in, in getting successful ion exchange processes in low pH applications. We're developing some new technologies and we're working with ion exchange resin uh, vendors uh, to optimize that opportunity for us so that when we put the project back into production, we're not struggling with a, a key aspect like uranium recovery in the plant. Uh, we expect to be complete with this demonstration about a year from now, in, in, um, in the middle of 2022. And after that, we'll be able to complete a feasibility study updated based on the results of this test and come to a final investment decision. Before we go further, let's just talk about the macro environment for a little bit. Outside of Lance, uh, the world is looking at advanced nuclear power as a solution to climate concerns, and climate is just becoming a larger and larger concern. Nuclear power is going to play a big part because nuclear power plants yield carbon-free electricity, and I think we're seeing a turning point in, in the dialogue um, around the world. Uh, people are embracing nuclear power for its green energy um, attributes, and, and we're, we're moving away from the fear-mongering and, and the anti-nuclear power uh, rhetoric that we're so accustomed to. Nuclear has a great future, and uranium is the only fuel for that. In the United States, uh, we've seen significant developments uh, starting in 2019 when the Nuclear Fuel Working Group uh, completed their study and, and found that support of U.S. critical infrastructure and especially the electric power grid depends on a diverse supply of uranium, which should include U.S. sourced uranium products. So the government acted. They funded a, a, a strategic uranium reserve with $75 million dollars. Uh, the Department of Energy is moving forward with uh, requests for information on how they should be expending that money. That's active right now, and we're preparing uh, responses for the Department of Energy. And, um, you know, we expect to see uh, that money and, and future funding deployed in, in the uh, accumulation of a strategic uranium reserve by the United States government that should very strongly support uranium producers in the United States like Peninsula Energy. Uh, additional actions, that in, in 2020, the U.S. government renewed and updated the Russian suspension agreement, and that agreement will further limit and reduce future uranium imports from Russia into the United States, opening the door for U.S. producers to fill the gap that Russia's been uh, filling with price insensitive material. In the state of Wyoming, I've been where I live, uh, we're very excited because the state has been selected as the future home of an advanced reactor demonstration project. Terra Power and the host uh, Rocky Mountain Power um, will be placing an advanced reactor at a um, retiring coal power plant site. We see opportunities there. Uh, we're very happy to engage with Terra Power and Rocky Mountain Power in supporting that project. Uh, it's an exciting time for nuclear in the United States and around the world. And uranium, again, it's the only fuel. And, and we think our place is, is secure. The opportunities for uranium production continue to grow and grow. And the pricing in the market continues to, to see upward trending. Turning to Lance, uh, let me tell you a little bit more about uh, the Lance project and the field demonstration that we have going on. Lance is one of the largest uranium projects in size and scale in the United States with 54 million pounds in one location. Um, the current market capitalization of our company and our project really undervalues that resource base when we compare it to peer groups. And I think that's a real opportunity for investors. Lance is currently licensed to produce up to 3 million pounds per year. We have a constructed facility that's capable of 
of producing 1.15 million pounds per year right now. So we have some staged expansion opportunities in the future once we're back up and running. Our plant is modern. It was built in 2015 or later, the well fields later. Uh, so Lance is a, a really modern facility. It's clean, it's ready to go. Um, we have production paused right now because we're waiting the project transition to low pH in situ recovery, and we're waiting for slightly better markets. Uh, we estimate a six month lead time to return to production, and um, that is after a uh, production restart decision. And that decision will depend on sustained uh, improvements in the uranium market conditions and also on satisfactory progression of our current optimization activities, which include the low pH field demonstration. Why are we applying low pH ISR processes at Lance when nobody else is doing that in the United States? Because globally, that's the best way to produce uranium. Over 50% 50, 50 of the global uranium produced in 2019 and again in 2020 was produced via low pH in situ recovery. And these companies populate the lowest quartile cash cost uranium producers. Lance is the only US-based uranium project authorized to use the industry leading low pH ISR method. We are fully permitted at this time to do that. Um, the low pH transition um, can start with the operation of previous well fields. We'll convert those well fields um, so that they are chemically compatible with the low pH um, uh, chemistry. And um, the capital requirement to do that and the conversions in the plant facility are about $6 million. Uh, we can ramp up to our full current capacity of $1.15 million uh, pounds per year. And uh, we expect that at that stage, we'll have an all in sustaining cost right around $40 a pound. The working capital to get our project from um, zero back to the full um, capacity of 1.15 million pounds per year is about $15 million plus the $6 million in low pH transition investment. So all in all, we're looking at about $21 million to put this project back to its full current production capacity. Once we get there, and if the markets induce us to do so, uh, stage two expansion, doubling the project capacity is viable. Again, remember our license is for 3 million pounds per year. Um, if we double our capacity, we see significant savings in our all-in sustaining costs, seeing a $10 reduction to $31 a pound, and that's going to require additional capital of about $43 million. The field demonstration is progressing as planned. Uh, we continue to uh, improve on key focus areas. Uh, the oxidation re reduction potential was one of those key areas. Uh, we're running at an oxidation production, uh, reduction potential right now uh, above 400 millivolts, and that supports higher uranium production grades. Uh, we've seen the, the pH come to the target point, and we're, we're operating our pH at, at target ranges. The recovery composite stream at our last update has surpassed 40 ppm. That continues to be true and we'll be uh, guiding the market and, and bringing another update to the market in the near future. Uh, the pH target, uh, again, has been achieved. Uh, the rate of acidification has been reduced just to maintain current pH levels. And we're performing ion exchange recovery uh, processes where we're recovering uranium today from the field demonstration and we're testing uh, new um, technologies on the ion exchange recovery front. Um, and, and so when we look to the future, what are the targets and objectives remaining for the field demonstration? It's to continue to evaluate several alternative uranium capture and recovery process options, which can improve upon the standard ion exchange performance. It's also to continue evaluating test pattern configurations. The way you lay out your injection and recovery patterns in a well field makes all the difference in, in how that uh, mine performs. Uh, we're going to focus on sustaining the improvements in the uranium recovery grade and continuing to see increasing uranium grades across the, the operation. And uh, we're continuing to work on demonstrating a complete uranium recovery curve using the low pH in situ recovery technologies on the Lance deposit.
we, as, as I have spoken to, have a well-defined pathway back to production. Today, we're doing technical optimization studies, and we plan to update our feasibility study at the completion of that. We're seeking further offtake agreements, and uh, we, we are well-funded, but we will require additional funding when we make the decision to ramp up to our full current uh, plant capacity. When we make that final investment decision, it takes about six months for us to install the transition facilities and to restart old uranium production areas that still have viable amounts of uranium uh, to be recovered. It'll take us also about 12 months on a parallel path uh, to develop new uranium production areas, which is the way we'll ramp up the project to full production capacity. So six months uh, to get the project going, 12 months uh, afterwards, we can put the project up to about full production capacity. On the sales and marketing and uranium um, side, uh, we have key advantages and key differentiators that put Peninsula ahead of our peer group. We're the only junior uranium producer with a long-term sales contract that extends to 2030. We have contracts in place for up to five and a quarter million pounds of, uh, to be delivered at prices that are well ahead of the current market price. Uh, again, our pricing formulas in our contracts are base price escalated. We can project that the escalation will put the pricing in the 51 to $53 price uh, a pound price range. Um, these contracts are with major utilities in both the US and Europe. About 4 million pounds of those uh, contractual are firmly committed, they will be delivered, and about 1.35 are optional at our customer's election. Um, how are we using that and how are we fulfilling those contracts today when we're not in production? Well, we've got matching bindings, uh, contractual purchase obligations that, that match with our sales obligations. In this calendar year, 2021, we have sales of 450,000 pounds, generating a net cash margin of seven to eight million dollars. We're able to acquire uranium at today's market prices, which is well below the price we're delivering uranium to. So we have cash margins that are sustaining our company. In 2022, we have the same thing. We've matched up our obligations for deliveries with, with purchase obligations. And we see an eight to nine million dollar a year cash margin on the, the 450, thousand pounds that we expect to deliver next year. You'll also have noted that, that Peninsula purchased a physical uranium inventory of about 300,000 pounds in late June of this year. We purchased it at a price of about 31.35 per pound. Today, the price of uranium is about 33.50, so that inventory is in the money. It's worth about $10 million. Uh, the uranium purchase was funded by a, com a recently completed institutional placement for Australian $13 million, which was followed by uh, an opportunity for existing investors to, to purchase shares at the same price. So all, all in all, we raised over $15 million uh, Australian, uh, which funded the uranium purchase. Why did we do this? Our board believes that the purchase of physical uranium is a low low risk strategy that strategically aligns us uh, and our with our funding requirements to transition Lance the Lance project. When we decide to make the transition, we have this uranium inventory that's valued at more than the the expenditures that we'll be committing to um, for restarting and transitioning the Lance project. This strengthens our current working capital position. It enhances our flexibility in the market, gives us opportunities to market uranium today that we didn't have because we weren't producing uranium. Holding a physical uranium inventory during this period where the U.S. government is actively supporting domestic uranium industry, uh, the, the domestic uranium industry means that we're going to have the ability to quickly respond to any opportunities that come our way. Uh, and boy, are the opportunities coming. Industry observers are watching the uranium market grow. Uh, we see Sprott Physical Uranium Trust now up and running with a $300 million U.S. Uh, at the market facility. They're out in the market recently purchasing uranium. I think they've used about 10% of that uh, placement capacity in the last week and a half. And they purchased over 1.4 million pounds of uranium uh, that we know of today as I speak. 
uh, they've been driving the price higher, and I think they will continue to do that. So it's a very exciting time in the uranium market, and the developments of the of SPUT, the Sprott um, Uranium Trust, have been driving uranium prices higher, and are expected to do so for the, at least for the foreseeable future. Other companies too are raising money for the purchasing of physical uranium. Uh, people are putting their money down that uranium prices are going higher. And the White House is signaling to lawmakers its support for ex keeping ex existing U.S. nuclear facilities running. That's very, very important for the uranium market, and that support is there today. Finally, I'll, I'll just wrap up with a, you know the key statistics of the company, the corporate overview. We have almost a billion shares on issue. Our current price is 14 cents, which makes our market capitalization 140 million. We have no debt, no term debt. We had cash at the end of the last reporting quarter of almost $7 million. We added to that cash through some sales subsequent to the end of the quarter. And we have about 310,000 pounds of uranium in inventory uh, valued at about $10 million. So today we're sitting with about uh, $20 million of, of uh, fungible assets, cash and uranium, which can be sold. Uh, we have a strong position financially uh, to work off of and, and to work well into the future. And we have uranium revenues. Our CapEx requirement, again, um, wrapping up and looking at the compelling proposition that we have. Our CapEx is low. Our time to restart is low. We're using the best technology for uranium production and in situ recovery. Uh, we're the only U.S.-based project authorized to do that, to use low pH in situ recovery. We have a demonstration going on that's yielding uh, news flow on a regular basis. Um, our ongoing cash flow is underpinned by our contract book, and we have over 310,000 pounds of physical uranium inventory to draw on for, for our cash needs when we decide to restart. In an environment where we have a positive outlook for the markets and U.S. government support for uranium production, uh, we're very excited to be positioned uh, the way we are today. Uh, well-funded and, and well-positioned to restart production at Lance. Thank you for listening to this presentation. I look forward to uh, taking some questions. Thank you for the presentation. I've got a handful of questions I'm going to jump right in on. Uh, and I want to start out just talking about uh, this low pH uh, in situ recovery. You talked about the cost advantages. That I've even read that uh, there might be some recovery enhancement advantages versus alkaline. Are there environmental advantages as well? I believe so. Uh, all three are true. Uh, we have uh, production cost advantages. Those production cost advantages are actually driven by the enhanced recovery that we can realize using the low pH chemistry. The low pH chemistry is generally a little more aggressive in the formation. It brings out the uranium faster and it brings out more of the uranium in our case. Uh, we have experience with the alkaline chemistry at our site. That's the way the project was started up. And we were only realizing about 40 to 50 percent recovery from the field. That's why we have field areas that have quite a bit of uranium left uh, and, and are, are real low hanging fruit for the low pH chemistry. We can bring that recovery rate up to 80 or maybe 90 percent recovery without investing in the development of new well fields. Environmentally, uh, we have demonstrated already with a field leach trial, uh, and we did this for the regulators, and they have uh, agreed that we can successfully restore the groundwater following our low pH uh, um, mining practice. Uh, we demonstrated the groundwater restoration and how successful it is. One of the interesting things about uranium solubility in the low pH environment is that as you raise the pH back up, which is pretty easy to do, uh, the uranium drops right out. So uranium groundwater restoration is actually uh, quite a bit easier in a low pH environment than it is in an alkaline environment where you have to reduce the oxidation reduction potential in addition to um, cleaning up the groundwater. It seems whenever I see a study on, on low pH, it seems to be in Wyoming. Is there anything unique about the, the Wyoming landscape formation that, that is well suited for this? 
in our case, uh, we have a little lower carbonate concentration in our ore body. Our, our ore has less than 2% carbonates, and that's a really important attribute because as your carbonate concentration goes up, uh, so too does the uh, requirement for acid. Uh, I think the South Texas trends, and I've worked in South Texas, and, and some of the other uranium trends in the United States uh, hold higher carbonate contents and make it less desirable to try to apply low pH. And I think that's why the U.S. industry as a whole has relied on the alkaline chemistry for so long, is because of the generally higher carbonate content in the ore. But you said that uh, worldwide this is very common, so I assume uh, Kakistan is, is doing this, Kazakhstan. You bet. All of, all of the Kazakh operations are low pH. Uh, Australian in situ recovery operations are low pH. You know, it's practiced around the world, and we're seeing almost 60% of the uranium produced around the world being produced at low pH in situ recovery plants. That's because it does generate uh, lower cost, lower production costs. So, like I said, uh, you know, low pH in situ recovery facilities populate the lowest 25%, uh, uh, the lowest quartile of, of uranium producers, you know, cost-wise globally. I heard you say the demonstration goes through the uh, the first half of next year. I also heard you say that you were probably six months away from making a decision. That sounds to me like you've kind of already know the answer. Um, I don't know that I said we're six months away from a decision. I think we were probably with the with the answer that um, once we make the decision, it takes about six months for us to be back into production. Uh, we are hoping that we can make the decision, um, you know, maybe sooner than the complete wrap up. A lot of the important learnings from the field demonstration have been obtained. We went through the phase of acidification of the ore body. We know what the acid consumption requirements generally are. We know how to successfully oxidize the ore body, with, you know, and, and enhance the oxidation reduction potential. So we can model our chemical costs now very well. Uh, what we haven't completed yet and why we continue to run the operation is we want a full uh, uranium recovery curve from the from the production operation so that we can model a full um, recovery curve based on field uh, experience rather than laboratory experience. Uh, and, and at that point, that'll set us apart. So many people do feasibility studies on simple laboratory tests. You know, we're going to do ours based on field experience. And did you indicate a feasibility study after the demonstration period's done, so starting sometime next middle of next year? That's right. Um, you know, we may get a head start on the feasibility study because so much of the key learnings are already obtained. Um, but you know, you can't emulate the the recovery curve until you've completed that work. Um, but yes, uh, our our ambitions are to take the learnings from the field demonstration, put them into a feasibility study. And then um, we have the best data for uh, making our production decision. That won't preclude us if the market turns, you know, um, favorable very quickly and and has strong uh, pricing. That won't keep us from, you know, committing into sales, uh, new sales agreements, and and preparing the project for production. We can do that now um, because we we have a good sense of how it will work. Um, you know, we could get a head start on some of the work, but but it's important that we take the right steps and be systematic so that we know uh, what our future holds. Let's jump into the contract book uh, since you started to kind of allude to uh, signing new contracts, et cetera. Um, first of all, uh, the uh, the sales agreement that you have, is that evenly spaced out? So 450,000 every year for the next up till 2030? It is, um, you know, our. I think the way to represent our current sales contract uh, portfolio is at least 400,000 pounds every year until 2030. And then you said you also have locked in some um, purchase agreements as well. So we shouldn't necessarily view this as an optionality where you can start up production versus buy on the spot market. Or maybe let me ask it this way, your, your purchase agreements, are those firm and of the similar size and the similar length as, as your sales yeah. agreements? We did, uh, we aligned our purchase um, 
our purchases with our with our sales um, for the next two years, 2021 or this year, 2021, and next year, 2022. Um, so you know we don't anticipate um, filling our our sales obligations with production this year or next year, but that doesn't mean we can't get going on production. But if you do production, then since you've already locked in purchase agreements, that would be more towards going new sales agreements, I would assume. Correct. Uh, that'll give us the opportunity to fill um, new new opportunities in the market and and also, you know, carry an inventory of produced uranium, uh, which may, um, you know, in the in the U.S. environment with the U.S. government purchasing program, U.S. production may command a higher price. Which, by the way, you mentioned the uh, uranium reserve. I've never seen it stated that it has to be domestic production. Everyone's kind of assuming that. Is, is that your understanding? Well, the, the request for information that's out from the Department of Energy has some guidelines in it and their their objectives, and that is one of the written objectives. Okay. So it's, it's a little more than my understanding. It is the way it is. <laughs> okay. I um, want to jump into financing of the expansion, and you hinted at perhaps liquidating your inventory. I think you said that it might be worth $10 million that would go towards uh, the expansion. Um, what about the that doesn't cover everything? What, uh, what do you, how do you see uh, fulfilling the rest of the investment requirement? Well, of course, we think that um, you know our our investment decision into you know restarting the project will be done in a better price environment. Uh, you know, today we're seeing 33.50 uh, on the spot market, about 38 dollars on the term market. Uh, but you know, in order to put our project back into production, we're looking for a little better price environment. So uh, I think there'll be some exciting times ahead. I think I think the stars are aligning very well with the market um, continuing to to improve and strengthen. Uh, so you know, I think you know that there may be an equity raise to to fill the gap. Um, but you know, we are we got out on the front foot and we put some money in the bank and and we're holding it in an asset that we expect to appreciate, which is physical uranium. So uh, you know, we have. Um, the money that we need to get started, and and when we make that decision, decision, I think um, you know we might be raising another 10 million dollars or thereabouts, um, maybe 15. Um, as I told you, I think we need about 21 million dollars to take the project from where it is today to a full uh, current production rate of over 1 million pounds per year. So we're we're not that far away. We have uh, you know about 20 million dollars today in in cash and inventory assets so you know it's just really you know when that decision gets made we'll we'll predicate how much money we need to get to full production rate what type of cash burn are you going through while we complete this demonstration well you know we've matched our, our expenditures including the demonstration um, with our with our income so you know generally speaking um, we can run a year or the course of this year and next year you know, without significant change in our cash position. Would you consider doing another offering and building up your inventory even higher? It's a possibility. It's not on the table right now, um, but but I think it was a really good move when we did it. We we caught the the market at a, at a time before it started to rise. As I said, you know, we bought the uranium around thirty one dollars a pound, and it's now over thirty three dollars a pound. So. Our inventory's in the money. I think it was a good idea. We think we think uranium prices are going to continue to appreciate, uh, but it's really not what we're here to do. We're not here to be a, a, a stock which is speculating in um, physical uranium. We're here to be a uranium producer. We're very serious about taking our project, getting it absolutely correct, and putting our best foot forward back into production. You talked about uh, expanding your resources, maybe in conjunction with the stage two expansion. When might you start doing drilling to uh, to do that? Um, as needed, we have a great deal of, of uranium ore delineated. Um, you know, we have the ability to move uh, quite a ways forward in the future. So it's not a priority for us to invest in expanding our resources. 
We have 54 million pounds of identified resource. Some of it needs to be further delineated and upgraded from inferred to uh, measured and indicated. Um, but we, we can do that very systematically over time. We don't have to do that um, as a priority now. What, what is the history of the property? Is it an area that's been well explored or, or do you think there's a lot of opportunity there? Yeah, uh, well, the project was initially explored in the 1970s uh, and then it was set aside uh, during, during the prolonged uh, down market that we had. Um, the project was put back together by Peninsula. Um, you know, the, the management team of Peninsula recalled the, the exploration drilling that was done in the area. It was able to collect the data and put the project back together um, in, during the Renaissance period, really starting in about 2008 or nine, so, you know, or even later. So Peninsula is a, uh, uh, the Lance project is, is really a project that Peninsula management took from uh, cradle to production. And that's a re really rare attribute uh, for a junior uranium mining company. So many focus on exploration and then want to sell the project when it comes to uh, production. But we have the production expertise on our staff. We have people with 40, 50 years of uranium production experience. And, and I've been in this industry now for uh, almost 35. Um, so, you know, and I'm an engineer, I'm a metallurgical engineer, and, and operations management has, has been the focal point of my uh, career before I ended up in executive management. Let's finish with some general industry questions. You've certainly outlined the uh, positive viewpoint of, of uranium and aren't alone in doing that. I'm asking a lot of the uh, management. That situation, that environment has been there for five, maybe 10 years. Why do you think we haven't seen a, a nice rise in uranium prices like everyone is forecasting up to this point? Well, what I actually see in the market is that is that the most important buyers, uh, which are the utilities, uh, still have reasonably good inventories to maintain um, their op their nuclear power plants, and and the utilities haven't been uh, the prevalent buyers in the market. Now, um, as time moves forward, you know they have unfilled requirements that they do need to fill, and it's pretty easy to project what those are. So we see the utilities needing to come to the um, uh, to the market eventually. Um, over time, over the last couple of years, what's been going on is that there was an excess of inventory in the market, and that inventory has been consumed. Even when Peninsula went out into the market to to acquire uranium, um, most of the people who were proposing to sell to us said, well, you'll have to wait until the fall or, or later before we have the material on hand to supply to you. So, you know, what's happened is the spot market is becoming a, you know, not a prompt delivery market, but actually a delayed delivery market, you know, by several months. The utilities uh, haven't been in there strongly and, and the inventory is drying up. Now that SPUT, uh, the Sprott Uranium Trust, has started buying uranium, you saw the effect of them buying a million pounds. It pushed the, the price up over $2 recently. You know, a million pounds is really a relatively small amount. And if we don't have a million pounds available in the market today, you know, where are we gonna get the tens of millions of pounds um, that the utilities will need uh, to fill their un unfilled requirements in the future? So on the supply side, why do you think we haven't seen as much exploration and development doing the type of stuff that you're doing? Because the price environment didn't support it. I mean, logic supports it, but price environment doesn't. Um, you know, there are plenty of idle projects that are ready to be put back into production like peninsulas and are still waiting for a price environment to you know, that supports their their uh, production ambitions. Um, you know, Peninsula happens to have great advantages in, in time and the amount of cash that we have to expend to put our project back into production. I think we're really at the front end of that with only, you know, a $6 million investment to put it back into production and only six months, um, you know, of effort to do so. Um, but, you know, there are many others uh, and you'll be talking with them, Mike, throughout this uh, summit. 
Um, so, you know, I think the, 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 the bottom line is that the price environment is not yet where it needs to be uh, to support um, additional exploration and, and additional uranium producers returning to production. Great. Well, I think that pretty much wraps up uh, the time we've got for questions. I appreciate your uh, presentation and your answer to my questions, and I wish you the best of luck going forward. Thank you, Mike. It's been a pleasure uh, joining you uh, in this summit today. Thank you for joining us for this C-Suite interview presentation brought to you by Channel Check. Visit our YouTube channel for more interview content, as well as virtual roadshows and conference presentation replays. New content is added regularly, so subscribe below to stay up to date. Visit channelcheck.com or click the link in the description to access equity research, news, and advanced market data on this and the 6,000 other small and micro cap companies listed.